Hello, my name is Bethany Chaplin and I am a Minnesota Green Corps member serving with Crow Wing Soil and Water Conservation District. And today I'll be giving a presentation on water quality parameters and monitoring. So a quick pollution review. So the World Wildlife Fund defines pollution as water pollution happens when toxic substances enter water bodies such as lakes, rivers, oceans, and so on, getting dissolved in them, lying suspended in the water, or depositing on the bed. This degrades water quality, and not only does this spell disaster for aquatic ecosystems, the pollutants also seep through and reach groundwater, which might end up in households as contaminated water we use for daily activities such as drinking or bathing. So there are a couple different types of pollution like we talked about before. So the EPA defines point source pollution as any single identifiable source of pollution from which pollutants are discharged. This can be from wastewater treatment plants or operational waste from industries. And then non-point source pollution is pollution that doesn't come from a single source, such as sediments, bacteria, nutrients, oil, grease, and antifreeze. So then the EPA has some different water quality standards. So when the water in our rivers, lakes, and oceans become polluted, it can endanger wildlife, making our drinking water unsafe and threaten the water where we fish and swim. The EPA supports efforts under the Clean Water Act and the Safe Water Drinking Act. So the Clean Water Act of 1972 regulates discharges of pollutants into the United States waters and regulates water quality standards for surface waters. The Safe Drinking Water Act established to protect the quality of drinking water in the United States and establishes minimum standards to protect tap water and requires owners and operators of public water systems to comply with all these primary health related standards. So then we have some water quality monitoring. So water quality monitoring can be used for many different purposes to identify whether waters are meeting designated uses to identify specific pollutants and sources of pollution to determine trends and to screen for impairment. And here this table on the right shows different sources of pollution and those common associated chemical pollutants. So cropland can pollute with phosphorus, nitrates, temperature, and total solids, whereas construction can contribute to turbidity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, total solids and toxics. So then the first parameter we're going to talk about is dissolved oxygen. So the definition of dissolved oxygen is the amount of oxygen dissolved in water. So oxygen is produced during photosynthesis and consumed during respiration and decomposition. So let's define those. So photosynthesis is the process by which plants use sunlight to create food from carbon dioxide and water, and there they create oxygen. And then respiration is the biochemical process by which cells of an organism obtain energy by combining oxygen and glucose, and they release carbon dioxide water and ATP. And then decomposition is the breakdown of organic matter by bacteria and fungi. So photosynthesis, since it needs sunlight, only occurs during daylight hours. However, respiration and decomposition can happen 24 hours a day. So oxygen consumption is the greatest near the bottom of the lake where that sunken organic matter accumulates and decomposes. And like terrestrial or land animals, fish and other aquatic organisms need oxygen to live. And as water moves past fish gills, microscopic bubbles of oxygen gas in the water called dissolved oxygen are transferred from the water to their blood. And low concentrations of DO or dissolved oxygen cannot sustain aquatic life. And pollution contributes to oxygen demanding organic matter from sewage, lawn clippings, soils from stream bank and lakeshore erosion, and from agriculture runoff, or nutrients that stimulate growth of organic matter, and pollution can cause that decrease in the average dissolved oxygen concentrations. 
So this figure in the middle shows that oxygen is in that lake system through photosynthesis from diffusion from the atmosphere or just the oxygen entering the lake from the atmosphere. And then wind cycling also is helping that dissolved oxygen get throughout that lake system. And then on the right, we can see the oxygen requirements in milligrams per liter. So a trout requires seven milligrams per liter of oxygen, whereas a walleye only requires five milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. And then we're gonna talk about temperature. So the definition of temperature is a physical quantity to express hot and cold. And temperature change can happen seasonally or daily in the surface layers, which are warm during the day and cool at night. So unlike all other fluids, as water approaches its freezing point and cools below four degrees Celsius, its density then begins to decrease until it freezes at zero degrees Celsius. And this is why ice floats. And thermal stratification is the phenomenon in which lakes develop two discrete layers of water of different temperatures. So it is warm on the top, like we see in the epnolimnion, and it's cold below, as we see in the hypolimnion. These layers are each relatively uniform in temperature, but are separated by a region of rapid temperature change, such as the thermocline. And then throughout different seasons, like fall and spring, you can have overturn of lakes where the temperature is going to be consistent throughout. And then in the winter, it's actually going to be warmer at the bottom of the lake compared to the top of the lake. And thermal pollution is almost always occurs as a result of discharge from municipal or industrial facilities. In running waters, particularly, particularly in small urban streams, elevated temperatures from roads or, or parking lots from runoff can be a serious problem for populations for cool or cold-blooded fish. And higher temperatures decrease the maximum amount of oxygen that can be dissolved in water, leading to oxygen stress if the water it is receiving high loads of organic matter. And most aquatic organisms are cold-blooded, which means that they are unable to internally regulate their core body temperatures. And fish, insects, and other aquatic species all have preferred temperature ranges. So we can see that picture on the right has the different temperatures that fish prefer. So a cisco prefers cooler water at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas a largemouth bass prefers water around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So next we're going to talk about nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen. So these are natural parts of aquatic ecosystems and they support the growth of algae and aquatic plants, which provides food and habitat for fish and smaller organisms that live in water. Too much uh, algae can cause um, algal blooms where the oxygen is depleted and it prevents sunlight from reaching other plants. And the plants die and the oxygen in the water is depleted from this. So sources of, that contribute to algae growth include animal waste and fertilizer. And then this can all lead to illnesses in fish and death of fish in large numbers. So as we can see in this diagram here, Nutrients are loaded into the lake system from fertilizer or waste. And then the plants use this as food. However, the algae blooms happen and they prevent the sunlight from reaching those other plants, causing the plants to die. And then the plants decompose and deplete oxygen even further. And then oxygen levels then reach a point where no life is possible for fish and other organisms. And next we have turbidity or total suspended solids. So turbidity is how clear the water is and the murkier it appears, the higher turbidity. So we can see in this diagram that the clear water has low turbidity and the murky water has high turbidity. And this relates to total suspended solids. So these are particles that are larger than two microns 
and they contribute to the clarity or turbidity of water. And sources include soil erosion, runoff, discharges, and stirred bottom sediment or algal blooms. So clear water is usually considered an indicator of healthy water. When concentrations of, two, of total suspended solids are too low, however, this can mean there aren't enough nutrients in the environment to support aquatic life. Alternatively, an overabundance of solids can indicate high turbidity, pollution, or eutrophication, or excess of nutrients. And finally, we have pH. So pH is a scale used to specify the acidity or basicity of a solution. Acidic solutions are measured to have lower pH values than basic solutions. So as we can see, they range from zero to six, seven being neutral, and then eight to 14 would be your basic solution. Uh, the pH of natural waters hovers between 6.5 and 8.5. And then pH can change with lake depth due to changes in photosynthesis or that decomposition and respiration. And the ability to resist change in pH is called a buffering capacity. So that would be its ability to stay at the pH that it was originally at. And when pollution results in higher algae and plant growth, this could be due to increased temperature or excess nutrients, pH levels may increase. And then we can see here on the right, the minimum pH levels that some species need to survive so a bass requires a pH around 5.5, whereas a perch can survive as low as 4.5 on the pH scale. And then how do we monitor all these parameters? So we can use a couple different types of equipment. On the left here, we have a YSI multi-parameter sonde, which measures pH, temperature, uh, conductivity, and dissolved oxygen. And then we have a Van Dorn bottle, and this can be lowered throughout a uh, lake to grab water samples that we can later bring to a lab to test for different uh, nutrients, such as those phosphorus and nitrogen nutrients that we talked about earlier. And then we have our Secchi disc, which helps test for, for water clarity. And this um, goes with that total suspended solids and turbidity. So the lower that we can put that Secchi disc in the water and still see it, the more clear the water is and the less turbid the water is. And then we have an on your own activity. Um, so with this activity, you will need a couple different types of materials listed here and then I have the um, instructions listed here and then a video to go along that walks you guys through um, the get the dirt out activity. And then at the end, so we've talked about a lot of different types of things today, but in the end, why should we care? Um, so I have a couple different pictures up here of wildlife in nature and some recreation that you can do and some different wildlife pictures. So we should care for drinking water purposes. We want clean drinking water that's not polluted to drink. Uh, recreation is also a big thing. So fishing, swimming, boating, and kayaking. And then for wildlife, for plants and animals and aquatic fish and insects so that they have healthy places to live and thrive. So I have some resources for you guys, um, a link to the On Your Own activity and a link to the video that I created. Uh, the water quality parameters um, that I talked about are on the wa this Water on the Web website if you want to learn more. And then a summary of the Clean Water Act and the Drinking Water Act. And then a mapping application for uh, protecting water resources in the U.S. and then an MPCA Impaired Waters in Minnesota 2020 map as well. And then I would like to thank you guys so much for joining me for this presentation today and please reach out to me if you have any further questions.